Good morning. Oh, now I'm getting some sound. Good morning. Let's all stand this beautiful Sunday morning. We'll sing, There's a Land That is Fairer Than Day. There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it afar. For the Father walked over the way to prepare us a dwelling place in the sweet by and by. We shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet. We shall sing on that beautiful shore The love the songs of the blessed And our spirit shall never more Not a sign for the blessing of bread In the sweet by and by We shall meet on that beautiful shore In the sweet by and by We shall meet tribute of praise for the glorious gift of his love and the blessings that follow our days in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore okay now you guys sounded pretty good, but she was a little bit weak on the sound coming out. Let's sing the chorus one more time. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. Much, much better. Now let's sing, I Fly Away. Some glad morning when this life is over, I fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I fly away. wasn't too bad. I, let's do it again just for fun, but that wasn't bad at all. Good morning. good morning. So good to be here at Calvary Baptist Church in Brenham, Texas. For those of you who are watching from home, we're glad to have you also. I am Pastor Billy Sutherland. It is a joy to be in the house of the Lord. I'm going to try that one again because some of you might not be quite woke up yet. So it is a joy to be in the house of the Lord. And we would rather be here than in the best prison in the country. 
or in the best hospital in the country Amen. or in a whole bunch of other places. So we're just glad to be here. And uh, it has been one year to the day that we started live streaming. And Derek has some pictures. I didn't happen to get them into the PowerPoint this morning, but I'll tell you what. We were using my iPhone smack dab right about where Tona is on a stand uh, to record the first service. And then we had an iPad strapped to a microphone thing back there, tie wrapped and Velcroed. And, and it, it just, it, i tell you what, it was some rough beginnings. But we have come a long way. We've been live streaming for a whole year. And that we're getting good feedback from folks out there. We're being able to minister to people we would never be able to minister to otherwise. So uh, I just thought I'd let you know about that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And as we do this, let's just kind of draw a curtain. Those things that are outside in the world, the worries and concerns that you have, the things that are going on, just, just kind of close them out. And Father, we just ask that you help us to focus on you, to focus on your word, to be listeners, and not just hearers, but also doers. Prepare us in this time to be the kinds of Christians that you want us to be, and we will give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. And Denise has a bunch of announcements. And you're going to have some help this time. Oh, I thought you were going to have some help. Good morning. Morning. <laughs> So we have a wide open pew section over this way, social distancing over this way. But you can sit anywhere you want to. You, you know, can. If, yeah, you don't have to. You can sit anywhere you want. And then please let your friends know that we are live on Facebook. You can share our live stream if you are watching from home. And then also please comment. The pastor does see those after the fact. And email. And email comments at calvaryburnham.org. And I do watch those. And then pastor and men do meet Tuesdays at 10. And Pastor Bruce joins us for that. Pastor correct? Bruce joins us for that. Yes, absolutely. And the ladies' Bible study does continue this evening. They meet on Sunday evenings at 5 o'clock in the small fellowship hall. And I think they had a great turnout last week. Good. I just noticed Jody over there. Yes. Glad she's Hi, Jody. <laughs> she's limping much better, <laughs> more mobile. Good to have you back in the house. And then Wednesday night, sandwiches and fellowship at 5.45, live stream 6.15 to 6.45, and in-house wrap-up 6.45 to 7. And after Easter, we'll start with our regular, like yes. we used to do, Yes, and we have meals. a sign-up sheet for meals if anyone would like to help with those. And then next Sunday is Easter. <coughs> we will not have Sunday school, but we will have our resurrection breakfast at 10, resurrection egg hunt at 10.20. And then resurrection worship with the Lord's Supper at 1045. It is about the resurrection of Jesus. I, I like to stop using the word Easter because Easter has just become so cotton picking commercialized. It's about the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And we have scheduled our spring car clinic for Saturday, May 15th, 8 a.m. to 11. We changed that up just a little bit from last time because we had people show up really early last time. So if it goes later than 11, we'll stay, but... You know what this one is? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I threw one in there. <laughs> Children's Sunday School is going to start up again and uh, after Easter. And where's Jen? Jenny, why don't you wave? Jenny is going to be teaching Children's Sunday School. We're going to get her the roster. Um, if your kids want to come and you're not quite ready to come to Sunday School, we'll pick them up. And we were talking this morning, we're also going to do a puppet ministry Oh, that's awesome. Calvary had one way back when. We have puppets. There's too. all kinds of stuff up there in that yes. room. We have puppets so, that were donated. Uh, yeah, that's going to be exciting. We're getting ready to do that. All kinds of fun stuff. And then we will receive the Annie Armstrong offering through Easter. We figured we would go ahead and extend that through next week. We have collected or received 591 to date. And then make sure you check us out at calvaryburnham.org for the latest news and updates. All righty. And children, come forward. Children, come on ahead. <laughs> hold, hold on just a minute, Jay.
Okay. <laughs> All right, kids. That's enough. Hush, quiet. I'm sorry, what? Come up here and tell me that. <laughs> if we be quiet, the rocks will cry out. Now, we're going we're gonna to have to practice this better for next year because I told them they're allowed to yell. And that, that was kind of quiet. It's the one time a year that we encourage our children to yell in church. And what were you yelling quietly? Hosanna, Hosanna. Because why are we yelling Hosanna? Jesus is coming into the city of Jerusalem as king, and that is what Palm Sunday is all about. The people were, the what, on a donkey, yeah. And I saw on Facebook there was a cute little picture of two donkeys, and one of the donkeys was saying, you know, last week Jesus rode into Jerusalem and everybody was watching me, and now no one even recognizes me. And the other donkey says, that just goes to show, without Jesus, you're nobody. That's not true, but it's kind of cute. That's not true. You are somebody, aren't you? I'm sure glad you got that. So it's all about Jesus riding into Jerusalem, triumphant, because he's going to be the king of kings and lord of lords. But what happens after Palm Sunday? Does anybody know throughout the rest of the week? Easter, Easter happens after? Um, the, the, last supper. the Last Supper happens in that week? The resurrection happens, but what happens before the resurrection? He died on the cross for our sins. Good Friday. She said happy Friday, but good Friday. We're happy because, because Jesus died, we can live again. Anybody else got anything else to throw in there? All kinds of things happened. It was a busy, busy week for Jesus, and we're going to be talking about that in our sermon this morning. Yes, the Pharisees told Jesus, tell your disciples to be quiet. And Jesus said, if they be quiet, then the rocks will cry out. That's, yeah, that's why you were saying that coming up the aisle. Very good. Anybody else have something you'd like to preach this morning? You've been awful quiet this morning. You got anything you'd like to add? No? I also know that Jesus told his disciples to find somewhere to have the last supper. Yes, yes. Peter and John went to find the place to have the last supper and they got that all prepared and that's where jesus instituted the lord's supper like we have next sunday yes ma'am and he washed their feet because he the master of the universe the king of kings the creator of all got down and washed the feet of the disciples something that a servant boy should have done all right you guys are covering it pretty well let's pray and Riley will take you to Children's Church. Father, thank you so much for these boys and girls. Thank you for them being here this morning. Thank you for them being excited about the triumphant entry of Jesus and his resurrection from the dead and all that happened in between. In Jesus' name, amen. And we didn't sing Jesus Loves Me. I don't want to cheat you out of that, so let's do that right now. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so, little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Now before you leave. This is your last chance this year to yell in the sanctuary. So as you're going out, you can run and yell, Hosanna, Hosanna. Let's see it. <laughs> Amen. Well, you know, this year, as years past, when we think about this season, Often we think about the crown of thorns that were placed on our, our Savior's head. Let's sing now about what Revelation speaks. It says he will have many crowns.
on his head. If you'll stand with me, let's sing hymn 161, Crown Him with Many Crowns. Once again, welcome for those who have joined us on the internet. We're glad you're here. For those in the house, we're so glad you're here. Anybody here for the first time or the first time in a long time? I think we got all home folk. We're so glad to see everybody with us this morning. And um, tithes and offerings. There are offering plates in the aisles. There are all kinds of ways to give. There's online giving. Uh, you can use the ca contact us part of the website to get an address if you want to mail a check. You can drop one in the lock box there is no excuse for not giving and no excuse for not giving with a cheerful heart although some people can do that without further ado we're going to have brother james come and he's going to read the scripture and pray and he will also ask the blessing on the offering good morning everyone i love to hear that that's great <laughs> yeah thank you thank you thank you yes it is my birthday Yes, I am 63, and I'm glad to be here and be 63. Today's scripture reading will come from John 12. We'll be reading verses 12 through 16. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. God bless the reading of your word this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the opportunity you've given us to come together and study in your word. We ask that you continue to open our hearts and minds to the message we are about to receive. We ask that you be, uh, bless Brother Billy as he delivers that message to us this morning. And we ask for your blessing on the offering this morning, Lord. We ask that you bless both the gift and the giver. These things we ask in your most holy and precious name. Amen. If you would, let's go ahead and stand and sing this chorus. God, you're so good. Soul and 
be seated, please. Our high priest and king, and the final sacrifice, Hebrews chapter 5. Go ahead and open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 5, and then also open to John chapter 12, and either stick your finger in there, or a gum wrapper, or something, or if you have a ribbon in your Bible like I do, you can put a ribbon there in John chapter 12. We're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 5, finishing up that chapter that we started last week and uh, going from there. <clears throat> Remember that Hebrews was written to Jewish Christians, and I believe that it was written to particularly Jewish priests. And I think we'll see some encouragement there that would apply directly to the priests, much discussion of the priesthood, Jesus is Christ, Messiah. And Christ, of course, is a title. We say Jesus Christ. We could just as easily say, or more correctly say, Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah, Messiah as high priest. He's above all the priests of the Old Testament, above high priests in the New Testament. And then we get to this warning of apostasy at the end of chapter um, 5. Last Sunday, we introduced to Melchizedek, so let's just real quickly review the 10 things that we know for sure about him. We don't know a whole lot, but these things we do know. Only three books of the Bible mention Melchizedek, and you can pronounce it. I asked somebody, somebody after church last Sunday asked me if, if we were pronouncing that correctly. I've heard people way smarter than me pronounce it different ways, so however you want to pronounce it, the fact is that the, these are the 10 things that we know about him. The New Testament says more about him than the Old Testament does. We know that he's a contemporary of Abraham's. We know that he has no recorded family. He, he could have family, but the Bible doesn't record it, doesn't tell us who. He was a priest of the God Most High, or the Most High God. He gives blessings, or at least we know one time when he did. He is the king of Salem, Salem later becoming Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Uh, name means king of righteousness. Well, if that doesn't sound like Jesus... The order of Melchizedek is royal and everlasting. So Christ is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Some people push that into that this was a type of Christ. I don't necessarily believe that. I believe there was the order of Melchizedek, that royal priesthood. And Christ is superior even to that. Melchizedek was greater than Abraham and Aaron. So quite simply, Jesus is superior to the Old Testament prophets, to the law, to the priesthood, to the prophets, even to the order of Melchizedek. He is a prophet, priest, and king. He supplies every need. He answers every question. He fits every role. So we had been talking about Melchizedek in chapter 5 and how Jesus is even superior to that, to the high priest, that Jesus is the great high priest. And then it's, it's as if the writer of Hebrews just kind of takes an inward groan because he goes on, you know, I mean, we're on a roll and there's all kinds of good things and praiseworthy things and, and wonderful things. And then all of a sudden we come to verse 11 and about this we have much to say. And it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. D does that describe you? I'm, I'm not accusing i'm just asking you to think in your own heart am i dull of hearing I, i've said before about how when i was studying for a test or something i'd read a book and after you read about a whole chapter you know you read a page you realize i, I haven't i don't remember a single thing i i read because i'm not really focused on i'm not really into it that's kind of a dull of hearing thing not really paying attention does that describe you Maybe when you first got saved, you were all excited and you hung on every word that Jesus said and everything that the Bible said and every scripture. And as you get older, it's just kind of blasé. Well, these Jews who had come to know Jesus and now were under persecution were thinking about going back to the old way. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, don't you do it. You need to pay attention. You need to sharpen up for though by this time you ought to be teachers the priests particularly would have been teachers under the priesthood. And, and now that they're Christians, they should be teachers about Christ. And they're being reminded to do that. For you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk and not solid food. 
Boy, that's a, that's a declaration, isn't it? Uh, who, who consumes milk? Now, I'm, I'll be first to admit, you know, my, my wife bakes a batch of hot chocolate chip cookies. I want a glass of cold milk. <laughs> I, I, I like to drink milk. I've discovered almond milk. Jenny and I like that. But I like milk. But I don't live on milk. I like the meat, I like fajitas, I like steak, I like all kinds of other things. Of the oracles of God, you need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk, who lives on milk, babies, is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature. For those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil... And this is something that the Bible repeatedly tells us. We need to try the spirits to see they be of... Don't just listen to everything that's out there. There is so much nonsense going out over the airwaves. There are so many false teachers that are out there. There needs to be this discernment about what is true and right. And this is the standard for that. If it is something outside of the Word of God, you need to be suspicious of it. So the king, looking back... This had already happened, and then the gospel of Christ was spread, and some Jewish priests got saved. We find that even in the gospels. And they know the history of what Jesus was all about, that he is Messiah. They know all about Messiah in the Old Testament. They have come to the place where they believe that he is Messiah, but now they're in this situation where they're thinking about turning back. So let's turn back. Let's look back. The triumphal entry into Jerusalem is what Palm Sunday is all about. It's what we are excited about. I kind of get a kick out of, I had prepped the kids, now yell when you come in, and, and they kind of yelled a little. They did much better on the way out, didn't they? We, we spend all year telling them, shh, be quiet, don't, don't yell in church, you know, just don't run. Don't. So it's kind of hard that one Sunday a year they're allowed to run and yell and holler and there was that going on. The crowds were yelling. They were yelling, Hosanna. Jesus comes in riding on a donkey, the crowd praising and shouting. And then there was that rebuke of the Pharisees that my friends here reminded us about, that they said, tell your disciples to be quiet. And Jesus said, if I were to able to get them to quiet, the rocks would cry out. So just kind of enjoy the time here. Jesus is a divider. Now, I flashed that rather quickly. Let me go back there because that's important. The danger of what would Jesus do? Remember we were in that big face. Some of you might even have the bracelet on that says, what would Jesus do? And, and there was this whole, I mean, there, I don't know how much money has been made selling bracelets and plaques and, you know, keychains and fobs and all these things that are out there with WWJD. What would, the problem with that is that most people really don't have a clue what Jesus would do. They don't know who Jesus is. They've boiled Jesus down to, I'm trying to think how to say this, in many pictures, you know, we don't have photographs of Jesus, so people have come along different times, and they've, you know, images of Jesus, and, and some of them, he looks downright sissy. I'm just going to say it. And, and he's not a sissy. He's a man. He's a man's man. For anybody to have taken the crucifixion the way he did and survived up until he's on the cross, all of the beating and all of the scourging and everything else that he endured... He was a man, but he's also a divider. And he says this in Luke chapter 12, verse 51. We're not to John 12 yet. This is Luke 12. Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. I'm, I'm going to be a contentious figure. There are going to be people who can't agree on who I am. I'm going to cause people. He is the divider. The calendar, first of all, is divided by Jesus. There's that time before Christ and there's that time after Christ. And, and the world, I remember when they first started teaching us, we can no longer say B.C. before Christ. It's going to be B.C.E. before the common era. We, we don't want to reference Christ at all. There's just this time period that their calendar goes backwards that way and it goes forward this way and right in the middle of it is Jesus Christ. He divided the calendar. Humanity... He said, you're either for me or against me. Humanity is divided over him, families, marriages, friendships. 
there are the two things that people say don't talk about when you're at a social gathering, you know, politics and religion. Both of them can get you in trouble. And in the last couple of years, it seems like they've kind of crossed paths. And if you're going to talk politics, you're also going to talk religion. It's a kind of a contentious thing, and people are split over it. He divides the sheep from the goats. He divides the wheat from the tares. He divides the good fish from the bad fish. In our sermon from Matthew 13, Wednesday night, we talked about the net and the good fish and the bad fish are sorted out on the beach. He divides the saved from the lost. Well, you actually decide that by not accepting Jesus as your Savior. But uh, in the end, in those examples of the wheat and the tares and the fish, it says at the end of the age, the angels come and they sort it all out. It's all divided because of who Jesus is. And in the section that we're going to look at, go ahead and turn to Gospel of John, chapter 12. In the Gospel of John, we're going to see some extremes here. We're going to see extreme hate and extreme love. We're going to see the Pharisees hating Jesus to the point that at the end of chapter 11, they actually get together and they're conspiring and they say, do you think Jesus is going to come to the feast? Let's put out the word that anybody who knows where he is will pay them to let us know so that we can catch him. The Pharisees, and then there's Mary who breaks the alabaster thing and puts the perfume on Jesus and we'll get into that in a little bit. There's Judas and Lazarus, two extremes that we have there in this passage. We have a shouting Hosanna. And then just a little while later, the crowd is probably many of the same crowd shouting crucify him. We have honoring the king. And then we have killing the savior. You look at the extremes that we have just in this short passion week or holy week. We have Peter who confessed you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And boasted, even though everybody else turns away from you, I'll be the one. And then we see Peter cursing and swearing, and I don't even know the man. And then the light, Jesus Christ, goes into the dark of the tomb. And all of that happens in just this short period of time. So John chapter 12, verse 1. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany. Lots happens in Bethany where Lazarus was born. If you were to go to Bethany in Israel today and you were to mention Lazarus, oh yeah, this is the town of Lazarus. This is where he was risen from the dead. This is so much important thing about Lazarus. And um, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Somebody told me one time, Lazarus' middle name is Comma. Every time you see Lazarus, it's comma, the one who Jesus rose from the dead, just like Jesus, just like Judas, rather, comma, the one that betrayed Jesus. There's always those descriptors, it seems, around them where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead, very important point. So they gave a dinner for him there, Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. Now, this is the evening meal, work is done, it's not in a hurry. You know, lots of times we get home from work, and I remember when I was a kid, mom would be cooking supper all day, you know, and we come home, and it's over in about 16 minutes. I spent all day cooking, and you wolf it down, and you're out to play, or you're gone, or whatever. The evening meal should be the time where you slow it down, and you have an opportunity to talk, and you talk about your day and problems, and maybe even have the family devotional. There's that time. That's what this is designed for. It is the time to catch up with what's been going on throughout the day. That's what the meal was designed to do. And look at who is there. Martha served. Martha is a servant. She is in this role. And I'm going to go to bat for Martha a little bit. There are people that kind of denigrate. You know, she was, Mary was the one who was the spiritual one. And Martha, she's just the, serving is a very important role in Christianity. As a matter of fact, when it describes what Martha was doing, it is the same word from which we get deacon. She was serving. Serving is an honorable thing. When Jesus washed the feet of the disciples, he was serving. When we go to that marriage feast of the Lamb in heaven, Jesus will gird himself and serve us. Serving is a very honorable thing. So if your name is Martha, and and people say, Martha, Martha, you know, and they're kind of... don't, don't, don't buy that. Martha is a very important character. Serving is a very honorable thing. Uh, and Lazarus was there reclining with him at the table. 
Now, this is not the same event that was in the house of the Pharisee. This one, the Bible tells us, was in the house of Simon the leper. Now, think about that a minute. If he were still the leper, they wouldn't be having dinner in his house. This is not the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. This is the house of Simon the leper, and, and they're there having dinner. I would have to say that Simon, at this point, was no longer a leper. And this is one of those times that I can't tell you, thus saith the Lord, but I can tell you that this kind of really makes sense. I think that the reason that Simon is no longer the leper is because Jesus had healed him. And that's why he's inviting them to his house. So we have Simon, the former leper, and we have Lazarus, the former dead guy, and we have Jesus who intervened in both of their lives and they're at this table and they're reclining with him at the table. And you know what? The religious leaders of the day hated Lazarus. Because Lazarus, everywhere he went, he told his story. Oh, you must be Lazarus. You're the guy that was dead and came back to life. And Jesus did it. And we'll see as we go along. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served and Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. In the Pharisee's house, it was the prostitute who did that. And they mocked Jesus and said, if you're such a great prophet, how come you don't even know that this is a prostitute that is ministering to you there? Well, this was Mary. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume, verse 4, but Judas Iscariot, comma, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, there's always that tagline for Judas, said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Let me tell you something about Judas. Judas, I think, is a classic example of somebody who knows the price for everything, but the value of nothing. There are people like that. They, they, they know the price of everything. They're, they're so conscious of, of what can be bought and how much it costs. But so many of these people who are well aware, somebody buys a new car, oh, you must have paid, you know, and they name the price. They know the price of everything and the value of nothing. And I think that's who Judas was. And he says, we could have taken that money and given it to the poor. Now, here's something interesting about Judas. A lot of the times I have to stop and say, now this isn't in the Bible, but this is what I think, right? I've told you that many times, and, and every time that I can't say, thus saith the Lord, or thus saith the word of the, of the, of the, word of the Lord, I stop and I, and I make that disclaimer. I don't have to do that here. I can tell you that Judas was a rat. I can tell you that Judas was a thief. I can tell you that Judas was a liar, because we're going to see some more about that as we go on, he didn't care about the poor. He cared about money going into the purse that I hold, from which I can take for my own need anytime I want. Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor. Isn't that great? When you don't have to guess somebody's motivation, when the scripture outright tells you what it's all about. He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. You can say with the authority of God that Judas was a thief. It says so right here in the Word of God. And having charge of the money bag. Why did he have the money bag? Because the others trusted him. That's another thing that you're going to find out. Judas was a con man. What does a con man do? Con comes from the word confidence. You gain the confidence of people and then you steal their money, and then they're ashamed and embarrassed because they can't believe that somebody so loving and kind and honorable would be a crook like that. But that's what Judas did. He gained the confidence of the disciples, however he did that, having charge of the money bag. He used to help himself to what was put into it. That's pretty clear, isn't it? I don't have to make up any allegations against Judas. There it is right there, verse 7. Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. I don't know that she knew that she was keeping it for the burial, but Jesus did. Verse 8, the poor you always have with you, 
but you didn't always have me. It's been a while since I looked at the number amount that the federal government has spent on the war on poverty. It is billions and billions and billions of dollars. But we still have poor people. We, we will have poor people. There are some people who just seem to be happy being poor. There are others, it's beyond their circumstance, it's beyond their means, but we, we tried to help. Years ago, I began to kind of notice that there were those churches that were of a more liberal persuasion that were really into the caring for the poor and food drives and all that kind of stuff. And then there were the conservative churches that preached the gospel truthfully and accurately, but they didn't seem to have that kind of ministry to the poor. And somewhere along the line, I thought, you know what, why can't you be both? Why can't you preach the Word of God and still care about the poor and meet their, meet their needs and be involved in missions and be involved in our car clinic and be involved in other things that we do throughout the year that we care about people and we preach the gospel? It doesn't have to be an either or. But Jesus is saying right now, this moment, you got me. And a lot of things are going to happen really quickly in the upcoming week. We won't be able to get to all of them. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, comma, whom he had raised from the dead. They're there to see Lazarus. And that's not surprising. The word of Lazarus had spread. I mean, there was a guy who was dead for four days, and now he's alive. You know, we hear of accounts that people maybe fell into a lake and they died and they took them to the morgue and as they're getting ready to do the autopsy, they, the guy groans and all of us, he's alive. A couple of hours. Somebody who's been dead for four days? That's pretty amazing. Verse 10, so the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death. They're not content just to kill Jesus. They want to destroy the evidence too. We've talked about conspiracies and how conspiracy is even greater than one person committing a crime because when you have a bunch of people even a couple of people conspiring you would think that at least one of those people can say hey hold on a minute this is not such a good idea let's not do this but but they not only thought it was a good idea to kill Jesus they said let's kill Lazarus too because he's evidence Everywhere he goes, he talks about Jesus raising him from the dead. Everywhere he goes, and we're going to get rid of Jesus, and we're going to get rid of Lazarus too. Verse 11, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away from the temple, from Judaism, and believing in Jesus. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And they're shouting this, and they're excited, and I can't help but think that some of this same crowd was part of the crowd that just a few days later was yelling, crucify him, crucify him. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it just as it is written, fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. And this is where you've heard me say, I think there are a lot of times that the disciples saw something happen, particularly I think when we do Lord's Supper service next Sunday. I think that as Jesus was repurposing Passover meal into the Lord's Supper, I, I can't help but think that the disciples said, well, that's odd. He, normally we would do this, but he's doing this instead. And when he takes the bread and he breaks it and says, this is my body, which I'll bet there were times that the disciples thought, that's weird, don't know what that means. And then later on, when they began to put things together, they said, hey, you know what? When Jesus picked up that bread and he broke it, the unleavened bread, because leaven represents sin and he's the sinless Savior, when he said, this is my body, that's what he was saying. Then they remembered when these things had been written about him and had done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. John talks about seven signs. Other scriptures, other gospels call them miracles or great works or great and mighty works. So the Pharisees said to another, You see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Palm Sunday, 
It's all about Jesus. It's about his triumphant entry. It's about kind of that moment where the fate is sealed and the Pharisees decide, you know what, we can't let this go on anymore. And the course for Holy Week is then set. The most famous person ever to visit the planet. Years ago, I took our youth group to a big youth rally and there were some actors there who put on this play. And in this play, some aliens came from another planet. You like it already, don't you? Aliens came from another planet and they made contact with some people on earth and they said, we have come to find out who is the greatest person who has ever lived on planet earth. And I don't remember all the characters, but one of them said Babe Ruth. Well, who was Babe Ruth? Well, he was a baseball player, you know, and they described baseball. Well, what is baseball? And they tried to describe baseball and, okay, that wasn't working. Maybe he wasn't. How about Hank Aaron? Because he beat Babe Ruth's home run record and the alien said, you, you mean Babe Ruth was running around and, 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 and Hank Aaron passed him? No, no, that's not. Okay, forget that. Abraham Lincoln. So they tried to describe Abraham Lincoln and how he freed the slaves. And, well, wait a minute, what are the slaves? And he talked about, you know, slavery. And he says, you mean that you people on this planet actually bought and sold people? Okay, well, wait a minute, that, that might not be... And they kind of stumbled through this, and the aliens were getting a little impatient. They said, there has got to be somebody on your planet who was the greatest, most famous. And one of the guys finally said, that has to be Jesus Christ. And the aliens got all excited, and they said, wait a minute. We know who Jesus Christ is. He's the Savior. He's the Son of the Most High God. He's the one who saves. He's the one who gives forgiveness. He was actually on planet Earth. And they said, yes, He was here on planet Earth. And they said, this is the most amazing thing. I'll bet you had a party. I'll bet, you, I'll bet it was exciting. I'll bet things were tremendous. And they talked about the palm branches, and they talked about Hosanna, Hosanna, the King in the highest, and and they talked about all that, and the aliens were excited, and they says, boy, this is great. This is what we came to hear. And then what happened next? And it got real quiet. And the alien said, what, what, what's the matter? What, what did you do next? And they said, we killed him. We killed him. We killed the son of the Most High God. We killed the God-man, Christ Jesus. Absolutely astounding. And it was a very touching moment for our youth at that place. So real quickly, there are just a bunch of things that happened during the Holy Week. Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. He spends a night in Bethany. Uh, he leaves Bethany, curses the fig tree, weeps over Jerusalem, cleanses the temple, spends the night in Bethany again. He goes on, leaves Beth, uh, Bethany the fig tree is withered. He goes into the Olivet Discourse. Judas bargains with the Sanhedrin to betray Jesus in John chapter 11 verse 57 is where the Sanhedrin had basically said, hey, if anybody out there knows where Jesus is, we'll pay money to have him. Uh, Judas took that up. Judas had put the value of the ointment at basically a year's salary. He sold Jesus for 30 pieces of, series, uh, of uh, silver, about four months of salary. Judas sold Jesus for three times less than that. Uh, he spends the night in Bethany again. Wednesday is a silent day. The scriptures doesn't record anything that happened there. Then Peter and John arrange the Passover meal. They meet with the twelve, washes the disciples' feet, and there is a teaching moment, if ever there was one. Judas departs, the Lord's Supper is instituted. Jesus repurposes the Lord's Supper into what we observe as the Lord's Supper. There's the Garden of Gethsemane, the betrayal of Judas and the arrest of Jesus. The house of the high priest, Peter betrays Jesus. He curses and swears and says, I don't even know the man. Then there are the trials of Jesus. Jesus is scourged and whipped. He, they're crying out, crucify him. Probably a lot of the same people who were crying Hosanna. Jesus is mocked by the Roman soldiers and they put the crown of thorns on his head and they do all kinds of untold things to him. Judas hangs himself. Jesus bears his cross and is crucified. And the seven sayings from the cross. 
I left out a bunch. But boy, that's a busy week, isn't it? And the death of the God-man. The death of Christ Jesus. The veil in the temple. We talk about the high priest who could only go into the Holy of Holies once a year. Twice, once for himself for his own sin and then once for the people. Veil in the temple is torn in two. The rocks are rent and the graves are open. Jesus' side is pierced. He's buried in a borrowed tomb and a guard is set to seal the tomb. And the disciples are distraught. They, they, is this how it's going to end? Do you think that they knew that Jesus was going to? I think some of them had hoped for. It's kind of like when Jesus was standing there in John chapter 11. He's calling Lazarus to come out. I can still see or I can still sense that there were some people who were, this is going to be good because Lazarus is going to have the power of Jesus. He's done miracles. This is a slam dunk Lazarus. And I can see other people saying, boy, I, Jesus went too far. This, this isn't going to work. This is going to look bad. This is going to blow up in his face. Would you have had the faith to know that when Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus come forth, that Lazarus really would come forth? So the disciples were distraught. And what if it ended there? What if we just close our Bibles and go home? Because the Bible says, if Christ be not risen from the dead, then our hope is in vain. We might as well just give up and go home. Okay, spoiler alert. Have you been watching a movie series or something, you know, and you miss one segment and you're talking to a friend and they tell you how it ends and you weren't wanting to hear that yet? Spoiler alert for some of you who don't know. Jesus does not stay dead. Continued next week. <laughs> the high priest and the final sacrifice. We've been learning all through Hebrews about this great high priest who doesn't have to go into the Holy of Holies on his own behalf to do away with his own sin because he is sinless. And he doesn't get a goat or an ox or a ram or anything... He sacrifices himself for us. He is the great high priest and it is the final sacrifice. What about you? When Jesus said, I come not to bring peace, but to come division. There are the sheep and the goats. There are the saved and the lost. There are the good fish and the bad fish, the wheat and the tares. Who are you? If you were to die right now, do you know that you would be with Jesus forever? Do you know that for sure? Or are you still wondering? Are you thinking, well, you know, I, I, I've done more good stuff than I've done bad stuff, but I'm not sure if my bad stuff is enough to keep me out of heaven. It's not about you. It's all about Jesus. Have you trusted him as your Savior? Do you know him as your Savior? If you don't know for sure that if you were to die right now, you would spend eternity with Jesus. That's the one thing that you need to resolve. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love. Thank you for this time and your word. Thank you for Holy Week. Thank you for Jesus entering the city of Jerusalem triumphantly, knowing that he has a really, really bad week ahead of him. Father, I thank you that you gave your only son. I thank you, Jesus, for choosing to die for us the great high priest made the final sacrifice for us. And I pray, Father, if there's somebody here this morning who doesn't know you as Savior, that would eternally change. Let's stand and sing our hymn of invitation, Tell Me the Story of Jesus. Tell me the story of Jesus, right on my heart. Yeah.
Thank you for watching. Those who are watching from home, those of you who are here in the auditorium, thank you so much for being here. We're going to say our benediction. This is the last time we get to use this one. We've been using it all through March. So make it count, and then we'll dismiss singing, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. So with me, if you would, now to Him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, According to the power at work within us, to Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Let's sing it like we really believe it.